Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to welcome you all to Sweden and to two days of what I hope will turn out to be fruitful discussions among so many friends of an open internet. A warm welcome to all of you who have used your valuable time to travel here to Stockholm and an equally warm welcome to all of you who are participating digitally from all around the world. Welcome to Sweden and to Stockholm, a capital literally built on water. In our modern world, internet has become one of the greatest global drivers for economic and social development. By the end of this year, we will have three billion internet users in the world and two-thirds of them will be living in the developing world. Today, more and more people work in the internet economy, and our global economy grows stronger as digital activities increase. Compared to one year ago, many more internet users today practice freedom of expression and information on the internet. For more and more people, human rights have become a reality also online. Today, internet is getting more and more pervasive, a development that is expected to continue. And this is one side of the coin, a side where internet helps lifting millions of people out of po poverty, increasing their opportunities to express their freedoms. The other side of the coin tells a completely different story. A story of how internet sometimes challenges our freedom and our perception of privacy. Since we met here last year, we have all learned a lot more about surveillance and how communications can be intercepted. During the last year, we have had more than one reason to discuss the behavior between states as well as the behavior of states within their own borders. I think we can draw a very clear and valuable lesson from these discussions. Namely, that all surveillance must be subjected to strict limitations because otherwise Surveillance can have grave consequences on our privacy and on human rights. If surveillance should be allowed and accepted, it must be based on transparent laws that are adopted through democratic processes, and it must be proportional to the benefits it brings in terms of reduced criminality and improved security. If it should be allowed and approved, Checks and balances must be in place, not afterwards, but beforehand. No system of surveillance can be justified just because it is technologically possible. In just a few minutes, we will kick off our first panel discussion with the theme, The Year of Infinite Meetings and Processes. And this is really a very fitting description of the last year, as we have had numerous meetings in many parts of the world. The amount of work that all participating organizations have put into these meetings is amazing and has been a valuable input in many ways. But we have also been dealing with, quote, international internet-related public policy issues, a concept designed to include all sorts of public policy issues, even though most of them would be dealt with better on a national basis. In fact, during the last years, we have all seen that there are some who try muddling the issue of surveillance with the issue of internet governance. 
And for sure, there are some that has a clear interest of doing that. But let me be very, very clear. The issue of surveillance and the issues of internet governance are very different things. My friends, we must be able to keep two things in our minds at the same time. To me, to Sweden and to the Swedish government, the only logical and sensible way to continue developing the internet is to protect and de develop the multi-stakeholder model of decision-making we already have. A model that already has been tried and proven to work. The multi-stakeholder model has proven successful in helping us transform our economy globally, regionally and locally. It has proven successful in giving more and more people the opportunity to exercise their freedoms and express their democratic aspirations. Sweden's support for the multi-stakeholder model is rooted in our firm belief that this is the only model that will continue to generate the technological developments and the solutions we need for the future and at the same time preserving the open nature of our common internet. Ladies and gentlemen, in a world where most of our lives and our devices are becoming connected, the issues of privacy and surveillance are becoming more and more important. And I am convinced that there are plenty of governments that need to ask themselves whether their actions are proportional. This is indeed a very important discussion. But it is a discussion that is completely different from the one of internet governance. If we cannot keep them apart, we will risk a development that is harmful for the multi-stakeholder process. Fortunately, I can say that we managed to have a balanced discussion in Sao Paulo last month. In that net, net mondial meeting, different stakeholder groups had to take a step out of their comfort zones to meet other vital parts of our internet community, and the result was extremely valuable. I believe time will show just how valuable it was. And the Brazilian stakeholders, including the Brazilian government, really do re deserve recognition for all the work they have put in to that conference. Later on this year, results from the Net Mundial will be taking up, taken up at the Internet Governance Forum in Istanbul. And I really do look forward to that. And I do hope that the Turkish government will take the Internet Governance Forum as an opportunity to develop their own policies on Internet use in a direction where communication and social media is embraced. Net Mundial, IGF, ICANN meetings. This is how we can reach a common understanding on the issues of global Internet governance. By all of us meeting, learning, sharing, and listening. And as in all mutually, mutually beneficiary corporations, no one can expect to get all of what we want. But one thing is very clear. It will for sure be much easier for us to agree if we limit the number of issues that we put on the table. And if we come to the table with a true will of reaching a common understanding. My experience is that the setting does matter. If we choose to cooperate in forums where we have, where we have to reach consensus, then we all prove that we have the ability to reach that. But at times, when discussions end up in a single majority vote, it sometimes is easier to take the easy way out. This is really true 
when it comes to issues of internet governance. Whenever we have multi-stakeholder meetings, the atmosphere is generally pragmatic and forward-looking. But when the same topics are discussed in settings within the United Nations, rough consensus and mutual trust is replaced by word-by-word -word negotiations and diplomatic charades. And this is very important to bear in mind, because next year, or possibly even this year, we could have a situation in the United Nations where a small number of radical countries could put forward proposals saying that internet governance should be given to multilateral control away fr from the multi-stakeholder process. That would be a great mistake. To avoid this, we need to rally support for the current model that has served us so well. But that does not mean that it is perfect. That does not mean that it can't be improved, because it can. We do need to improve the way internet is managed today. We need to build global confidence in internet governance by ensuring global participation and gl global responsibility. Therefore, we need participation and responsibility that is shared between all stakeholders in all countries. One important step to achieve this was taken on March 14th this year, when the United States National Telecommunications and Information Administration proposed to hand over the US management of certain internet functions. A move that is at the same time good, necessary and timely, which will strengthen the support for the multi-stakeholder process and help us keeping the internet free, open and stable. One of the most important tasks we have today is to stress how important the multi-stakeholder process has been to ensure the success of the internet and how it contributes to prosper prosperity and social development. It has been proven so many times that when internet penetration increases, so does GDP and economic and social development. If we can present an even clearer link between the open internet community and economic development, I believe that more countries around the world will embrace the current system for internet governance. The member states of the OECD have agreed on principles for internet policy making with, with recommendations on how to promote access to an open internet. Most of the countries, including my own, that have achieved a high penetration of internet usage have more or less applied those principles. But the next billion internet users will not com come from Sweden, nor Europe, nor North America. The next billion internet users will come from the developing world. And if more of the countries that those people live in would apply these principles, more people would get access to internet at a lower cost. But some developing states outside the OECD circle of members have signaled that they don't see these principles to be relevant to their experience. Let me respectfully disagree. The OECD principles state, for instance, that we need to promote the free flow of information, investments and innovation, elements which are vital to achieve prosperity and economic growth regardless of national borders, elements that are not typical Western concepts, but equally important for a wise internet policy making in developed countries as well as in the developing ones. And it is my firm belief that countries and people all over the world 
will benefit from those principles. Ladies and gentlemen, the coming days and the coming years, we need to focus on three things that I have mentioned this morning. First, we need to put the debate on surveillance and the behavior between and within states to a place where it belongs and not confuse these important discussions with the equally important issues of internet governance. Second, we need to continue building an open system for internet governance that guarantees influence of all stakeholders. And last, and maybe most important in the long run, we need to refocus on how a free and open internet promotes global development, increases respect for universal human rights, and increases social and economic welfare in all parts of the world. With these words, I would once again like to welcome you to my hometown, to Stockholm and to the Stockholm Internet Forum. Thank you for the attention. <laughs>